Good morning, everyone. So it is a joyful thing to gather together, and God bless you all for being here. We do gather together because the Holy Spirit calls us here, and the Holy Spirit gathers us together as the people of God, one body in Christ. God of mystery, you called Ananias by name, and he responded, Here I am. You called Paul to the work of your church, and he responded, by giving his life to your word. Similarly, you call us into community and faith, so we respond with love and time, energy and hope. We respond with worship. Let us worship the God of transformation and grace. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our sovereign Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God of new life, what would we give to have you appear with a flash of light and a clear voice like you did for Saul? Maybe then our doubts would disappear. Maybe then we would live as you have called us to live. However, when our lives depend on faith, we forget your surprising grace. Instead, we draw lines around enemies and friends who's in and who's out. We see the other faster than we see our neighbor and refuse second chances. Pull the scales from our eyes. Help us to see as you see. Help us to live as you live and forgive us when we fail to. Humbly we pray, amen. God who is rich in mercy loves us even when we are so inwardly focused we fail to see the other fail to see God's presence and grace, fail to acknowledge God's love, and fail to experience God's joy and answers to prayer. Unravel the sin that blinds us to the ways God intercedes for us, loves us, and calls us to be godly people, patterning our lives after our Lord Jesus Christ. By grace and in the name of Jesus Christ, God forgives us and saves us from our sin. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus, you forgave sins even of the one who persecuted you and your followers. Grant us grace to receive the same mercy for our sins and have our lives forever changed by you. Unravel the blindness of our hearts and lead us to acknowledge you as Lord and King. Help us to know the transformational power of your mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now we pray for open hearts as we prepare our hearts to hear God's word to us today. We pray, God of unending surprises, this life is a tapestry of moments woven together, and we long to be weavers of love. Today we gather and pray that you would unravel our bias, unravel our assumptions, Unravel whatever it is that keeps us from you. And as you do, clear space in our hearts for your word. We are listening. We are praying. Amen. The first reading today is a reading from Isaiah, the 51st chapter, verses 1 through 6. 
Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation. For a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and my heart arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And now a reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. Glory to you, O Lord. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, but they saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing, nothing. So his friends led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and at the house of Judas. Look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision, he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name to the Gentiles and to kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. 
and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. So there at Judas's house, the room was full. The house was full. We are familiar with the story of Saul's conversion to Paul, but there's more than one character whose path is unraveled at Damascus. First, of course, there is Saul, as I said, and we've heard the story about him. And he considers himself a faithful Jew, and that's important to remember. He is a zealous defender of the faith. He knows what he knows, what he knows about God and the law and how things are supposed to work. And nothing can move him from his mission, from his understanding, from his job to eradicate the foundling groups, the foundling group that is following Jesus Christ. And he feels justified in his enthusiastic pursuit of those he considers heretics because they worship the chief heretic, that one they believe was the Messiah, the one who died on a cross, a criminal. Saul makes it his mission to let all with ears to hear and eyes to see, to know what happens to heretics who follow, who continue to pursue and worship that ghost. But on that day, on the road, traveling to Damascus, he is struck down. There is a blinding flash of light and then nothing. And then a voice, unlike any he has heard before. The voice of Jesus and an instruction to follow the directions he will receive when he arrives in the city. He must wonder how that's ever going to happen now. He's helpless as a babe. But Saul isn't alone in his travels. He has a retinue of assistants and servants, and they also hear the voice. They see nothing, but they hear. And they see that their master and leader is suddenly helpless, without sight. And he depends on them now to guide him, to help him, to keep him safe. They must lead him by the hand now, and he must follow. Without them, he would be lost or worse. There is a disciple in that town by the name of Ananias. He is a disciple of Jesus, one of the way, the name of that very early group of followers, that very early church who professed Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the Messiah, as Lord. Like all disciples, Ananias is constantly on the lookout for those who would wish to do him harm simply because he worships and shares the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. He believes in Jesus. He believes in the Messiah, the love of God who was born into the world with power to heal and cure, who preached good news and told everyone about the love and mercy of God. On that day, along the road and in the city, each of these experiences an unraveling of their own as God works to transform them and place them on a new path, the path that God desires and wills for each of them, the plan that God desires and wills for the world. Saul's life, identity, and worldview are suddenly altered, broadened, and made new. The result of this unraveling and transformation is a new path for Saul, along with a new name. This path fall, finds him witnessing to Christ rather than persecuting him. He will risk danger. He will go to new and unfamiliar places and will endure prison and persecution and trial as he sets forth on this new path. 
He also finds himself belonging to a new community with hope, framing his new perspective of God's work. God's working of faith within us. He finds himself in uncharted territory where he will learn to trust in Jesus Christ and rely on the hand of God leading him and guiding him to places unknown and experiences unforeseen. Like Abraham and Sarah before him, like Simon, whom we now know of as Peter, as a sign of the transformation and realignment that makes him an apostle of Jesus and a change agent for Gentiles, he is given a new name, Paul. He is set on a new path with new insights into the glories of God and the divinity of Jesus Christ. And Paul becomes a foremost apostle and missionary to the Gentiles. His understanding of the resurrection of Jesus has helped formulate our theology and the theology of every Christian denomination around the world. Ananias is a disciple of Jesus. When the Lord comes to him in a vision and calls his name, An Ananias answers him as Samuel did before him, Here I am, Lord. But when he receives detailed instructions to go to the grand persecutor of Christians to heal and assist him, Ananias protests. He cannot understand why the Lord would use him to heal one who is so earnestly serves as an enemy, an enemy of the church and all who believe and profess in Jesus Christ as Lord. To follow the Lord's command requires Ananias' fear to be unraveled. To follow Christ's will means unraveling his perception of what the family of God looks like. For it is God's will that Paul become an ally and apostle. To answer the call, God transforms Ananias from fearful, hesitant disciple to change agent for Saul. He is given a new understanding of the power of God to grant new life, forgiveness, and a new identity to the wayward, the sinner, the unbeliever. Paul is transformed by God from enemy to brother, from persecutor to chosen instrument. And his transformation is radical. His story, dramatic. Now this story is often entitled The Conversion of Saul, but it is not only Saul who is changed, as you see. Each person in this story is witness to the broadness of God's mercy and forgiveness and is thus changed as well. How do our stories align with the characters in this narrative? What attitudes, perceptions, and convictions need to become unraveled in our lives in order to live as true disciples of Jesus Christ? Do they have to see do they have to do with who we see as acceptable in God's eyes and who we see as rejected? Is it our understanding of where the limits of God's mercy, love, and forgiveness lie? What attitudes is God working to unravel in our lives and in our world? What beliefs about other people need to be transformed? Our world today is consumed with conflict and dissension. In so many ways, we have lost the ability to speak, to debate, to respectfully research information we have that forms our opinions. Anyone whose beliefs or opinions diverge from our own immediately becomes the enemy. Rather than learn from one another, as Paul learned from Ananias, we stake out the territory of our beliefs and we guard them as zealously as Saul once zealously defended the traditions and laws of Judaism as he understood them. Political, racial, and religious divides create pockets of distrust 
and misinterpretation. Divisive individuals then find fertile ground for disseminating misinformation and myth that are too often received by too many as gospel truth. What needs to be unraveled in our lives? In what ways do we need to be truly enlightened and transformed? Now, in our study on Tuesday, we watched a TED Talk given by Megan Phelps Roger, Roper. Sorry, It is entitled, I Grew Up in the Westboro Baptist Church. Here's Why I Left. If any of you know of the Westboro Baptist Church, you know that they make a practice of picketing uh, events that are held, including funerals that are held for Christians condemning them to death, condemning them because of the sin that they see that they commit. You can check out the video on Zion's Facebook page. There's a link to it there. But in her talk, Megan reveals that she was raised from the time that she was a very small child in this church, and she grew up in this notorious church, and she absorbed the vitriolic teachings there, that basically taught that anyone who did not subscribe to what this church subscribed to or believed as they believed was a sinner, was condemned to the fires of hell. She absorbed those vitriolic teachings there that pit people against one another. She took part in those marches, in those protests, carrying signs, condemning various groups, and people to hell. There is no question for her that this way that she had been taught up was the right way, the right belief, and the right action to take. She was convinced of it. But then she came, through patient conversation and persistent nudging of strangers on Twitter of all places, to consider another way of thinking and being. It took courage. It took courage to open her mind. It took courage of those who were willing to listen to her and reflect back to her what it was that be they believed that didn't quite align with what she believed and why they believed it. Ultimately, Megan left that church, and that meant turning her back on her family and everything and everyone she had ever known. She goes on to describe four but powerful steps that she discovered during that time are essential when confronting someone with strongly held beliefs or convictions that counter your own. And I think that following these steps can help unravel the animosity that fills our interactions these days, fills our interactions with those who see things, believe things differently than we do. The steps are not difficult and they are consistent with what Christ himself revealed, even if sometimes they seem hard to follow, especially if we are unwilling to open our hearts to another person. The first thing is don't assume bad intent. Remember Saul. His actions aligned with his very staunchly held beliefs that his religious system was under assault by those who followed a heretic called Jesus. Realize that like Paul, the other firmly believes not only that they are right, but that they are in the right. Think about that for a moment. Unraveling preconceived notions or a lifetime of learning or deeply held beliefs takes time, patience, deep, active listening and respecting the other. The second thing that she advises is to ask questions. Develop a curiosity of why people believe the way that they do. Come from a place of interest rather than testing or rebuttal. Allow your anger and distrust to become unraveled and show care and love rather than impatience or disdain. Then stay calm. Don't escalate. This, my friends, appears to be a lost art in today's world. Finally, make your argument. This step invites you to share why you believe something is true. Use the scriptures. Use your experiences. 
Use the ways in which you have come to know Jesus Christ. And do not assume that your position is obvious in articulating both how you got to where you are in your belief, both you and the other person have an opportunity to learn with mutual respect and honesty. You know, Jesus did a lot of teaching. He did a lot of explaining. He did a lot of listening. He still does. And we too need to do a lot of listening. Through prayer, we listen to the voice of God, and we listen for God's leading. Listening with care and respect to the fears, concerns, and beliefs of others, and engaging in this kind of thoughtful conversation can bring healing and better understanding along the way. We are not responsible for unraveling the hearts and passions of others. God can do that. Your actions, my actions, can go far to bring peaceful interactions to our world. Be willing to have your own convictions unraveled, to discovering there are better ways of viewing things or viewing people or learning that your interpretations and assumptions about them are wrong. Pray. As we listen deeply to one another, God can and will unravel our expectations and our deeply held, though sometimes flawed, convictions. God will bring healing and compassion to our conversations. God will bring the ultimate transformation we all need through the forgiveness of our sins, our prejudice, our stubborn adherence to our opinions and false beliefs. Look to Jesus, who leads us and guides us. As Saul's friends were sent to lead and guide him when he was blind. Look to Jesus, who unravels the path we have planned and places us on one of his own design. And may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through our Lord and Savior. Amen. join our hearts together as one and pray for the church, for all of creation, and for all people in their need. Father, we pray for those who take care of the earth. We pray for those whose roles are to guard the earth. And we pray for those who use the earth with wisdom. We pray for those who see the beauty of the earth and put that beauty before our eyes that we too may see it. We pray for the mountains and the oceans, for the wind and the rain, for flowers and for all creatures. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In these difficult times, we pray for the church. 
We pray not only to survive, but to thrive. Let this pandemic be the fire that refines us and reforms us. Let us become stronger. Align us with your will, with the work you have for us. As we find ourselves cast out of the church building and into the mission field, open our eyes to your light. Give us hearts of obedience, Lord, hearts to follow your call. Beyond our comfort zone, beyond our fears, into the places we call impossible. As you have made us in your image, let that image be a picture of action, action in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those who hear your voice and see a new way, a way you are calling them to follow. We pray for courage and strength, along with your inspiration. And we pray that those who are called will not follow that way by themselves, but they'll see us beside them in their journey. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Overcome our fears and hesitation. Open our eyes to the vision of you. Lead us out of the confinement of our assumptions. Push us out of the stifling restrictions of our comfort zone. Show us a better way, your way. And as you call us to your work, to your way, open our eyes to the shield you offer us. Give us the peace that comes from following your call. Inspire us to follow you in ways we thought were not possible. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for caregivers and researchers, for patients, emergency workers, Pray for students and teachers and parents facing the uncertainty of this coming school year. Lord, grant protection and wisdom to all of them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compassionate God, merciful Father, many of your children call out for your healing. People we know and ones we don't know. Yet you call, you know them all. Today especially, we pray for Pastor Courtney, for James, for Benjamin, Isaac, and Kristen. Pray for the family and friends of Rhonda Buckwalter, for Don, for Donna, for Reed, for Rich, Sean, Ira, Rosa, Sandy and Mike, Leslie, Joe, and Kyle, for the family and friends of Russ Wagner, for Karen Borton and her family, for Karen, for Lori, for our service personnel, our homebound members, for Helen and Mary and Martha, Pat, Chuck, Steve, and Jan. Are there others for whom we should pray? And we pray for all those whose hearts and lives are in pain today. Pain of broken dreams and broken promises. We pray for those whose hurt has closed their eyes to you. Even in that blindness, Lord, let your peace and your comfort and your healing flow to them. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Thanking God for his goodness and generosity to us, we offer to him the gifts that he has first given us. O oh God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, 
to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. It comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. O Lord, our God, King of heaven and earth, as we pray and adore you, we are reminded of your steadfast love and mercy to your human family throughout all of history. We remember your saving love which has come to us again and again, and finally, in these last days, has come to us in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who in the night in which he was handed over to die, took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and gave it for all to drink, saying, This is my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We pray now in the words that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For this is the body of Christ, given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. You may consume. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with spiritual food, the body and blood of Christ. All who come to you will not hunger. All who believe in you will not thirst. Empowered by this sacrament, send us back into the world to do the work that you have given us to do, to share the gospel and be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now the blessing. May God take the loose threads and the tapestry of our lives and bless them, and in blessing them, keep you in his grace now and forever. The blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit empower you in grace-filled living today and every day. Amen. Another announcement that I want to make is just really a, a great big thank you. We have several members of our congregation who come together month after month and help with the community meal. We have members of the congregation that also donate certain supplies to kind of flesh out the meal, like um, toilet paper and water bottles. The people who receive these meals are so very grateful and look forward to them. And as time goes on, we've seen evidence this week that the effects of uh, what has taken place in the last several months with the COVID virus is beginning to catch up with people. 
We're getting more calls in the church office for assistance. I got one last night at 6, six o'clock last night, and Jim and I were working with that family until about 9 o'clock last night. So we know that there are more and more people who are going to be falling into the cracks and needing help. On Friday night, we had a wonderful um, engagement. We had some folks for other churches, so we're reaching out to other churches, inviting them to join us in this ministry. And so we had folks from St. Paul and Lidditz here who were kind of learning the ropes of how we do things in hopes to take away some new learnings of how to do this in a time of, of uh, pandemic. We actually ran out of food on Friday. We had so many people coming. And so um, just a great big thank you to those who do show up, who cook the food, who donate things, and to all of you who have contributed to um, the funds that help us to do this, as well as to the Synod that uh, gave us a grant to help us in this work and in the housing of individuals who are so um, negatively affected by COVID. And so may God continue to bless us with you and with your prayers and with your generosity and with the hands and feet of those who feel moved during this time to continue to feed the hungry and house those who need shelter. Thank you all for being here and we have our final sending song which is Jesus Messiah.
peace. Christ is with you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.